This study is going to be called The Temptation of Isolation. There is a teaching out there that teaches Christians should isolate themselves in the last days, should voluntarily get away from everyone and everybody and just kind of be with their own selves and with the Lord. And I'm doing this study while I'm aware of the fact that there are believers in some areas that just don't have anyone to fellowship with. But I'm not talking to those people. And recently I read through the Pauline Epistles, and I wrote down a bunch of verses that show that Paul was a big believer in Christian fellowship. This isn't going to be a study on why we should go to church and how you're sinning if you don't go to a church building. I'm not going to be talking about that. I will not be using Hebrews 10.25. It's going to be a study on why Christians shouldn't isolate themselves and why Christians need fellowship. You can't get around it if you are a Bible believer. But Christian fellowship is talked about a lot more than Christians breaking fellowship. I'm also aware that not every Christian is in a position to have fellowship with another Christian in person. I also understand that every person isn't in a situation that they can just pack up and move to another state for fellowship. So for these people, I'm sorry, God knows your situation. I know that we're living in a time when church attendance is considered the highest form of being spiritual, but it isn't. There are people in church who are full of the devil and don't even live as right as many Christians scattered across the world who don't go to church or even have a church. I know people personally who don't go to church, a church building and would put half the people to shame in church buildings. If the best you can do is fellowship with someone through email the cell phone, the internet, or something like that. I understand your situation. I believe I'm balanced on the issue. Some men will teach you're not right with God unless you're in fellowship with other Christians, regardless of your situation. And then some men take it too far the other way and forsake fellowship altogether and teach that you're supposed to get away from everybody and isolate yourself, even though they could easily have fellowship in their area, wherever they are. But here are some things I noticed while reading the Pauline epistles to help fight the temptation of isolation, which I believe many people might have. But the first thing I noticed is Paul talks about prayer partners. In Romans 1, 9 through 10, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making a request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Over and over, you see the Apostle Paul talking about praying for him, for others, and how he prays for other Christians. If you completely isolate yourself from other cr Christians, you won't get prayer requests. You won't have anyone to give you prayer requests to. Paul teaches for us to be in fellowship by the fact he mentions prayer so much. Romans 15.30 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Notice the phrase, strive together. Christians need other Christians to fight the devil, the flesh, and the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? And one Christian with God is better than a million men without God. But two Christians who both have God is better than one Christian with God. Matthew eighteen twenty says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about not separating yourself from everybody. I'm talking about you need a Christian friend to talk to, to be in fellowship with. The next thing is Paul desires to be around other Christians. Romans 1, 11 through 13. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also even as among other Gentiles. So here Paul tells the Romans that he longs to see them. He isn't wanting to isolate himself from the Christian world. He wants to be around them more. 
And what you're seeing today is a lot of these preachers, especially on YouTube, they, they've studied so much, they think that they're right on everything, and they can't deal with disagreements, so it's caused them to want to separate from everyone. And they're even getting on their videos and telling you that you should isolate yourself from everybody because they can't get along with anybody. Philippians 1, 23 through 24 says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So his heart is to help other Christians, to pray for them, to teach them, make sure they have everything in order. So he has a desire to be with others. Romans 15, 32, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. So Paul had a love for the brethren. For him, it was refreshing to be around other Christians. I know sometimes you go to church and no one wants to talk about the Bible because most Christians are worldly. I only talk about politics and sports and what they're binging on Netflix. But if you keep trying to seek out Christian fellowship with somebody and asking God for it, you'll find it. It may not even be at church. It may just be, you know, at your workplace. And if you don't find it, then maybe you could win some people to the Lord to fellowship with. By saying you're going to isolate yourself from other Christians and people, and there are people that teach this, this shows you aren't trying to win anyone in your area, or you wouldn't be isolated. You will win someone to the Lord to fellowship with eventually. We are all part of the same body. That's another reason not to isolate yourself. Romans twelve four and 5, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So does the Lord want the body to isolate themselves from each other? Obviously not. We all have different gifts and talents and abilities that we can use to help each other. Romans 12, 6 through 8 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. 1 Corinthians 12 12 through 17 says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? So you see, every member is important. And if every member is important, why would you teach that a Christian should isolate himself from another Christian? Unless that other Christian is in sin or something like that. But if someone's living right and they're a born-again believer and you're a born-again believer, you have no right to say that you don't want anything to do with that person. Another thing is, Romans 12, 9 and 10, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. It's hard to show brotherly love and be kindly affectioned and prefer one another if you completely isolate yourself from other believers. And I watched a whole video of this guy saying that he is teaching everybody to isolate themselves from other Christians and living out in the backwoods somewhere. It's going to be hard to love and kindly affectioned to one another if you're purposefully isolating yourself from everybody else and like i said if you're someone that lives somewhere where there's not really any christians i'm i'm sorry about that i'm not talking about you i'm talking about these people who there are christians around where they live 
and they are voluntarily choosing to have nothing to do with any of them. Another thing is helping brothers and sisters in need. Romans 12, 13 says, Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. So Paul teaches to give to the necessity of the saints. How can someone give to your necessity? And how can you easily give to others if you've completely isolated yourself from them? Times are hard and it's not worth being a lone wolf if you don't have to. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul talks about giving to other saints. If you completely isolate yourself from everyone else, then you're not going to have the sa any saints to give to. The next thing is you need to be in fellowship through the good times and the bad times. Romans twelve fifteen, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. I've had a good time fellowshipping with other Christians, rejoicing over things that's happened in our lives, and giving comfort to each other's times of trouble. It's hard to rejoice and weep with Christians when you're a lone ranger. And most Lone Rangers don't want to rejoice with other Christians because they are so jealous over the victories of others. Many times they don't want to weep with other Christians because they secretly rejoice over the downfall of other Christians. Are you isolating yourself because of a fallout with another Christian? Has it made you bitter to the point that you can't rejoice and weep with another brother or sister in Christ? He said to weep with them that weep. Romans 15, 1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So if we're going to bear the infirmities of the weak, we're going to have to be around the weak. Some Christians are feeble. They can't make it on their own. They need guidance. They need support and help from other Christians. Maybe they are old and unhealthy. Maybe they're just, just sick. Paul teaches fellowship is a must for this reason. Bear the infirmities of the weak. Be there in the good times and the bad times. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. It's hard to get comfort if you isolate yourself. I know that some people can only have Christian fellowship over the telephone or the internet because of where they live. And I understand that situation. I'm not talking about these people that are in that situation. But if you have Christians to fellowship within your area, it's a lot easier to get comfort in person. The same way a real-life relationship with someone is much better than a long-distance relationship. And I'm not saying it's wrong to fellowship over the internet. Maybe that's all you can do. Some people would have to do it that way because a lot of I hear a lot of preachers and they don't understand that in some areas you can't find a Bible believing Christian. You can find a church, but you'd be better off not to go to the church that's in their town. You'd just be better off to be at home and listen to a Bible believing preaching on the internet because there is no Christians to fellowship with. And then that, well, that preacher will say, well, they need to move. You got to understand that. Not everybody can just pack up and move. You've got to realize that not everybody's in that situation. But you need to fellowship as you can rejoice with them and weep with them that weep. Christians should be your rejoicing. The souls of people you win to the Lord will be your rejoicing at the judgment seat of Christ. The Christians you help grow in the Lord will be re your rejoicing. 2 Corinthians 1.14 says, Also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. The next thing is admonishing one another. Romans 15.14 And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. When you aren't around other Christians, then you aren't accountable to anyone but yourself. 
And many times when the Lord is the only one looking, you think it's okay to do something that you shouldn't. When you are in fellowship with other like-minded Christians, they can admonish you and instruct you and warn you and eventually get you to turn from your wicked sin that you have going on and live for God again. But some of the greatest Christian fellowship I've had wasn't in a church building. And like I said, I'm not teaching here about church attendance. This is about not isolating yourself from every person. You can actually isolate yourself from people even though you're in church. I mean, you can go to church and sit there and not have fellowship with anybody. You can completely isolate yourself while going to work. You can completely isolate yourself while, while going to the store and living your everyday life. I'm talking about not isolating yourself from other Christians, not church attendance. But some of the greatest Christian fellowship I've had wasn't even in a church building. It was with Christians that didn't, didn't even go to the church that I attended. I've had a lot of Christians at work who we'd talk about the Bible together the whole eight, whole eight hours we were there and listen to preaching at work. And I'm aware of the fact that most people in the church building do not talk about the Bible. And if you were to talk about the Bible with them, they'd have no idea what you were talking about. And also they'd think you're crazy when you get into the deep things because they think the entire thing revolves around don't do this and don't do that and salvation and genealogies and comforting. They have no idea what's in the Bible. They think it's just a sweet little book of devotions. They, the average Christian thinks God is just this little puppy dog in the clouds that's He's always for you. And all the contemporary songs, it's, it's just about he is so, he's so for me. He loves me. All these things like that. That's what they think Christianity is about. The average Christian thinks that because they don't read the Bible. But I don't want to use that as an excuse to tempt me into isolation. Just because the average Christian knows more about sports than the Bible, I can't let that tempt me to isolate myself from them. And many times, over and over, you see Paul talk about local groups of believers. Well, Paul teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ's body is the church, and it's made up of all born-again believers. He also teaches of local churches, assemblies of believers. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. To them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So this church is not a building, but a church can meet in a building. Some men are completely against meeting in an organized building that people refer to as a church. They believe you should only meet in houses or storefronts. But does it really matter where you meet as long as you meet up with other like-minded King James Bible believers? whether it be in your house, in a church building, or in someone's front yard. Galatians 1-2 says, And all the brethren which are with me, and to the churches of Galatia. Notice Paul has brethren with him. He's not isolating himself. He says, To all, and all the brethren which are with me. And mentions churches of Galatia. Little groups or assemblies of believers fellowshipping wherever they can. Most likely in their houses or whatever. But they fellowship somewhere. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that y'all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Paul's not looking for you to have division. He's not looking for you to isolate yourself over stupid junk but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto be of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. I believe some people choose to isolate themselves because they can't deal with minor disagreements with others over certain convictions, certain minor doctrinal beliefs, likes and dislikes, so they become a lone wolf. Some people will sit under a preacher and the moment he says something they don't like, they get full of anger and hate from that point on. They end up being divisive and contentious. But Paul teaches Christian fellowship, not dividing, not contending with each other over every little thing. Ever thought about this? Maybe a last day's 
plan of the devil is to divide and conquer. And the reason that you got these preachers saying you need to isolate yourself. You need to get away from everything and everybody. Maybe they're working with the devil's plan. Obviously unknowingly. So that he can divide and conquer. 1 Corinthians 1.12 says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. There are so many different Baptist camps, and many of them hate each other. They look down on each other and slander each other. This is just unnecessary division. If you're a Bible believer and you have the right gospel, I would fellowship with you. Everything else, for the most part, is minor. Minor things. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and other, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So you have divisions. You have some people going around who isolate themselves from other Christians that are different than them. Some saying, I'm of James Knox. I'm of Peter Ruckman. I'm of Sammy Allen. I'm of Stephen Anderson. I'm of Jack Hiles. Everybody follows somebody, but you can follow others even if there are minor disagreements there. I like what David Hoffman says. He says, I don't agree with myself half the time. It's okay if someone disagrees with you because you're not God and they're not God. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen through 19. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. The fact that there was divisive people and contentious people and people teaching heresies didn't cause Paul to just say, just break fellowship with everybody and isolate yourself. Just because all that stuff's going on doesn't mean you should isolate yourself from every Christian. Second Corinthians twelve twenty says, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, so Paul, who, who wants fellowship with other Christians, because he is going to come to the Corinthians, he fears that he is going to find all these things, debates and envy. Because the Corinthians were so carnal, they are worldly. James 3.16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Maybe you have a problem with envy and strife. You need to get victory over these sins so that you don't end up isolating yourself from every person for the fact that you can't get along with others. You expect a drunk to pray for victory over his sin, so you need to pray that your heart will get right and you'll quit envying and causing strife between other Christians. 2 Corinthians thirteen twelve through 13 says, greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. Many times Christians today won't even say hello to you at Walmart because they're so full of their self and jealousy and so contentious. Back then, Paul was telling them to greet one another with an holy kiss and all the saints salute you. Paul seems very sociable. Even if he had a temptation of isolation, it didn't show. Galatians 2, nine says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen, and they into the circumcision. So this is where you get shaking hands from. You give each other the right hand of fellowship. Proverbs 18.24, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So don't go up to your brother's wife and greet her with an holy kiss. Give her the right hand of fellowship. It's hard to shake someone's hand if they don't get around somebody else 
They have handshake emojis, but that's really not like the real thing. And if virtual fellowship is all you have, I understand your situation. If you cannot be around other Christians, I understand your situation. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Christians, specifically the ones teaching to isolate yourself from everyone else, that that is part of the devil's plan to divide and conquer. Um, if virtual fellowship is all you have, then that's just all you have. If the only way you can fellowship with another Christian is by the way of email or the internet, I completely understand. Galatians 2.12 says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So Peter was eating with the saved Gentiles until the Jews came in, and he separated himself from them. And this isn't how a Christian should act. That's not good fellowship. Don't be ashamed to fellowship with any Christian who is living for God, even if they stink, even if they're newly saved, even if they are annoying. You shouldn't be afraid to fellowship with anyone who's a born-again believer who's trying to live right. Another thing is judging matters calls for fellowship. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 4 says, There any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. So these things are impossible without fellowship. How can you judge matters without being around other Christians? Another big one is Christians shouldn't isolate themselves because Paul teaches the need for pastors and teachers. Since Paul gives instructions on which kind of men should be pastors and deacons, I believe the Christian fellowship should have pastors and deacons, if possible, and not just a group of people simply sharing their thoughts on what they read the night before. There needs to be a pastor. There needs to be a teacher. 1 Corinthians twelve twenty five through 28 says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second early prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So you need someone to teach you, or you need to be teaching someone. You need a pastor. That is why Paul has taught us to ordain elders in every city. This is why Paul gives qualifications for being a pastor and a deacon, because there needs to be pastors and deacons when you come together. You need to come together to hear preaching and to admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You need a man who has studied, who has studied the Bible and can teach you and lead you the right way, if possible. But like I said, some people, maybe you're a person who lives in an area where you all the all the churches around you, the pastor is a complete idiot. He doesn't even know which Bible's right. He doesn't even preach or teach the Bible. And I mean, many pastors are like that today. They don't even need to be the pastor just because they have some type of certificate from somewhere. I completely understand your situation. Maybe you're in a situation where you don't have a pastor, and. So I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about people that live in an area where there are Bible-believing churches scattered around, and yet they believe that they don't need a pastor because they, for some reason, believe that they know everything about the Bible and that they can correct everyone else. That's who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the person who lives somewhere in an area where there is not a Bible-believing church with a Bible-believing pastor. 
And I'm aware that it would be hard for a lot of people to find someone to be their pastor. So they have to get online and and watch, you know, Bible-believing videos on YouTube or whatever else. I completely understand their situation. I, I'm talking to the people who don't have an excuse. But don't let the fear of an outsider coming in scare you away from fellowship either. In 1 Corinthians 14.23... It says, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and I'm not going to get into the tongue speaking thing right now, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? There is a teaching that you shouldn't let unbelievers come and sit under the preaching and hear the singing. But 1 Corinthians 14, 23 proves otherwise. This doesn't mean the lost person can't take part by preaching and teaching. I mean, this, this doesn't mean that a lost person should come in and take part in the preaching and teaching. But why can't they just sit there and listen and possibly even get saved? If the preacher preaches right, they'll either get saved or eventually leave. Or play the part of a, a saved person. Uh, you don't have spiritual eyes to see who is saved and who isn't saved anyways. Unless you are a fruit inspector judging everyone's salvation. Basing their eternal life on whether or not they commit sins that you don't commit. So if a lost person comes in where you're fellowshipping with other Christians. You don't have to just kick them out. I mean they can sit there. They don't have to participate in the preaching or the teaching or the singing they can sit there and observe some people are against bus ministries and everything else because they say that it's bringing lost children into the fellowship but even if you had a house church and had families with a lot of kids there would be lost kids in there too and when you get to the point where you're so against everything and everybody, you'll never be able to fellowship and you'll always isolate yourself. And the more you isolate yourself, the more self-righteous you will become. You will continue thinking you're right and that everyone else is wrong and that you're the only one right with God and that you're in a situation where you are one of the lost, one of the only Christians left that are righteous. You'll get to a situation where you think that you're the only one that's right and you'll just start going crazy. And I've seen that the Christians that teach isolation, when I first started listening to their teachings, they had some great stuff. And the more that they isolated themselves, they got a little bit crazier and a little bit crazier to the point that they're just teaching crazy things. But Paul's always talking about a church in thy house, a church in your house. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 through 20 says, The churches of Asia, Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet you one another with an holy kiss. So there's nothing wrong with meeting in your house. If there isn't a Bible-believing place that Christians get together in your area, start meeting at someone's house. If you don't have someone to pastor or teach right off, get some sermons from a Bible believer off the internet and do it that way until God gives you a pastor. And once again, this isn't a teaching about attending church. I mean, I, that's something I can't stand is hearing someone constantly harping on church attendance, especially when you're there. If you're sitting there in church and you have all these people in church, there's no need and continuously harping on church attendance. But you don't want to be so against meeting in an organized church building that you will only have church in a house without a real pastor. And then you don't want to go too far the other way and say everyone meeting in a house is not right with God. As long as you're fellowshipping with other Christians. That's the, that's the key thing. Christians are different in different areas. God uses different types of men for different people. Some people aren't churchy. There are all kinds of Christians who are King James Bible believers who don't meet in nice buildings, but meet in each other's houses. It's not right for me to say 
that those people aren't right with God. It's not right for me to say that they're doing this because they don't want to sit under a pastor. Because many of them do have pastors. Plus, if you're in the Bible Belt, you don't want to make the mistake of thinking that every area has a great Bible-believing church like your area. We need to be more understanding of people's situation and not take it too far the other way and say that they're not right with God for being for not being in, in a church building. Give people a break. You can tell when someone is trying their best and when someone isn't trying their best. But another thing is, if you isolate yourself, you can't sing together. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you don't fellowship, then you can't sing together. Admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is impossible without another person. But this has just been a few things to give you an idea about why isolation is not a good thing. And many have people have the temptation of isolation. I at times have the temptation of isolation. Uh, I'm sure Paul did too. I'm sure many Christians in the Bible at times had this temptation. But they didn't give in to that temptation. And like I said, you may live in a place where there is no Christian that you even know of around you. And that's completely understandable. And it's completely understandable that you can't just pack up your things and move. I mean, that, that drives me crazy when I hear a preacher say, well, you, if you live in a place where there ain't no Christians, then you just pack up and move. Not everybody can do that. Everybody can just pack up and leave where they're at. So what you could do is just go out, pray to God and say, God, I, I want to lead people to, to the Lord for me to fellowship with. And go out and start witnessing to people. And eventually you'll have some people to fellowship with. But this has been the temptation of isolation. And this hasn't been a um, rebuking to people who don't attend, attend church. Like I said, this wasn't necessarily about attending church. It was about people who won't have anything to do with anybody who are teaching that you should isolate yourself from other people. And there are people that are teaching that, that you should isolate yourself from every Christian out there is what they're saying. And just let it be you and the Lord. But this has just been a quick study on that topic, and I hope it's helped someone out there.